Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another brand new episode of Collider Mailbag. This is the show where we answer your viewer submitted questions. How do you get them on the show? You can get them on this show on the weekend or on our daily movie talk show. You send in an email to collidervideo at gmail.com and we'll pick out a few to answer on this show. Uh, Join me today uh, is uh, the lovely Sinead DeFries. How are you? Hey guys, I'm good. How are you? Good. 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 What about you, Perry? I have an important question for you guys. Yeah. Are you hungry? Always. Yeah, definitely. I might have gone to the supermarket today. Oh my God. I did a little shopping. What'd you get? Just oh, some donut holes. Oh. That is the nicest ever. Because it's not going to be awkward to eat while talking during a show. I also can't open the box, and I'm going to rip it like an animal in a minute. That's awesome. There we I, go. There we go. Problem solved. Yes. You guys now we can look. get that sugar high. That's amazing. And this show is sponsored by Entenmann's. Yes. Is it? No. Oh, okay. It should be, though. No. Yeah. Maybe they'd be open to it. All right, uh, while Sinead <laughs> reads the first question, I'm going to sneak some donuts. <laughs> All right, Philip writes, hey, Glider crew, you guys are great. My question is, if you replace the actors from the MCU with the actors from the DCEU and vice versa, which characters should they play? For instance, Mark Ruffalo could play Batman and Ben Affleck could play Tony Stark. You don't have to do every one of the actors, just a few. Thank you guys and keep up the great work. Well, I couldn't <laughs> get, get I couldn't get box. that open. All right, well, while holes. you answer, yeah, okay. I will take care of this. Uh, you should, actually, you think, should have to do the marshmallow game. We're like you just put poppums in your mouth uh, and you have to answer the question. I would I would lose <laughs> that. Uh, uh, this question is actually kind of a fun question. Just uh, thinking about swapping actors from the DC universe into the Marvel universe because you know the actors when they go out for these jobs they're, they're trying to get you know whatever they don't specifically go okay I only want to be in a, a DC movie I only want to be in a Marvel movie so we you could we could have ended up with various different things. I, I think a natural one Jason Momoa could play Thor. Mm-hmm. Um, That's the first one I have. Yeah. Literally what I wrote. <laughs> yeah, I did a swap with that. I did Chris Hemsworth as Aquaman. Um, you could have Amber Heard as Gal Gadot or uh, Black Widow. Uh, what do you have, Harry? My mind went more so to people who I think didn't get the opportunity to shine in their respective role or movie. And I was thinking Lee Pace as the Joker, because I think Lee Pace is an absolutely incredible actor, and I love Guardians. I mean, we're going to get to that. It's my my favorite MCU movie. And I think Lee Pace deserved the opportunity to show off a little more range. He does in that movie, though, so I I can't knock that role too much. But I think he'd make a a pretty good Joker. And Amy Adams, I want to see her have some fun. Let her be a superhero. I feel like... uh, Lois Lane can be a little bit of a wet blanket in these movies. So I want to say, I don't know, Scarlet Witch. Name any female superhero. And Amy Black Adams, is, she's an incredible actress. So I really think she could do just about anything. Mm-hmm. Sinead? Um, I, well, I had that first one. I thought it could be a straight swap. Yeah. But funny enough, I don't think that um, Chris Evans and Henry Cavill could do a straight swap. Like, I don't see it happening. Mm. Like, I, I think I could see Chris Evans as more... Or not Chris Evans. I think I could see Henry Cavill as more of a Captain America than vice versa. Um, But I will say that I definitely think I could see Scarlett Johansson being kick-ass enough to be Wonder Woman for sure. Um, And I almost feel like um, I would want to see... Why can't I think of his name? I would almost want to see like Ben Affleck not play such a... Such a... um, such a such a darker role like Batman. I would love to see him do something crazy and weird, and like maybe give him like Loki or something, and mm. see what he could do with something like that. Because I feel like the Loki is is supposed to be like the crazy one of the MCU, but he actually ends up being like one of the favorites because he's got so many levels. I feel like Ben Affleck would be awesome at doing something like that. But I wouldn't want it to be so obvious, you know? Like I wouldn't want it to be like straight swaps. I would want to change it up a bit. I feel like Jeremy Renner could probably be a fun, kooky character. Yeah. Like uh, uh, now the the name is escaping me. What is Jai Courtney's role in Suicide Squad? Boomerang, uh, Captain, Captain Boomerang. Boomerang. Mm-hmm. I feel like seeing Jeremy Renner in that role could actually work really well. Yeah. I could see Colby Smulders, and, and obviously we talked about Jamie Alexander playing Wonder Woman. I uh, could see a swap between uh, Grant Gustin and Tom Holland. Do Grant Gustin as, as Spider-Man and uh, uh-huh. Tom Holland yeah. as a Flash. And Margot I that Robbie. Too. I feel like it's because they're the same age, yeah. though. Yeah, Margot Robbie, I feel like could totally slay as Black Widow. Like I feel like I would totally buy that. Yeah. All right. 
Uh, why don't you guys uh, let us know who you think from the DC Universe actors could play Marvel characters and vice versa in the comments section below. All right, what's next? Jonathan Wright, Take Lighter Crew, thank you for all the great programming. You guys are part of my daily routine. Question for you guys. How long before we can see Tom Cruise take over the Jim Phelps role as team leader and hand over the reins to a younger agent? Curious to hear your thoughts. Thanks, and keep bringing on the filthy. Oh, I thought something sim similar to that was going to happen in Mission Impossible Ghost Protocol because they brought on Jeremy Renner in that movie and it kind of felt like it was supposed to be kind of a passing of the baton <laughs> to him, which twice for him has not happened. I mean, it would ha like they tried it for Bourne and then they tried it for <laughs> Mission Impossible. And I think people just like Ty Tom Cruise in that role so much they aren't ready to let him go. And then that's evidenced by Rogue Rogue Nation. Uh, that was a fantastic Mission Impossible film, and, and Tom Cruise killed it. And so I don't see that happening anytime soon. Maybe later on they will. Um, you know, the la the latest Jack Reacher movie I wasn't a fan of, didn't like that. So maybe if they, you know, start making Mission Impossible movies like that, maybe <laughs> maybe he'll have a quicker transition to, to that. How, what about you, Perry? I don't think it's going to happen. Okay. Maybe it's... It's going to be interesting to see how the next Mission Impossible movie does because I imagine, I mean, he is he is getting older. He has to stop all of this eventually. However, there isn't a single, you know, sign of that whatsoever in any of these Mission Impossible movies or any action movie that Tom Cruise is doing that he's going to want to, you know, take a step back and chill out and let someone else do all that stuff. So, I don't see this happening in the near future. More so than anything, I'm just curious to see if this franchise continues to crush it at the box office, they're going to want to find a way to continue it and it's just going to be interesting to see how they do it without him because you know, Mi Mission Impossible is its own thing, but I really think the success of this film franchise is Mission Impossible with Tom Cruise. Mm -hmm. One can't really exist as successfully just in terms of financing and, and box office draw without the other. Yeah, and not, yeah, not only is he starring in all these movies, he's producing these mm -hmm. movies as well, so that that's a big part. I wouldn't mind if anything in the next movie just seeing more of the team. That's always my favorite stuff with Mission Impossible is when you see them all work together. I think Tom Cruise is fantastic in these movies, but I do like to see the the team building and you know, like I had a lot of fun with Rebe Rebecca Ferguson's character in the last movie, and you know, I, I love Simon Pegg and Jeremy Renner's fine, and I just like the whole group. Yeah. All right, uh, what's next? Sam writes, hey, Glider Crew, nothing against airports, but the airport scene in Civil War is almost universally lauded for me because it fell flat. No one brought their A-game due to the constraint that heroes don't badly hurt other heroes. A lot of people have love actually in their favorite films and adore the final airport scene for its cleverness, but I found it a lazy way to connect multiple Richard Curtis screenplays that didn't work on their own. My question, are there movies that you find hard to watch purely because other people love them for the same scenes that frustrate you? Keep up the great content. Perry? I have the opposite problem where, all right, first, first actually, I have the opposite problem and right now it's happening with Ouija, I didn't. I didn't hate that movie by any means. I don't think it's a total disaster. I I didn't like it as much as other studio horror movies that we've gotten this year. But the overwhelmingly positive response is making me talk more negatively about it yeah. than I intend to now. It's like I feel like I constantly have to, like really, like just hardcore defend my opinion anytime I'm talking about it and. It's just a little frustrating to me that everyone's like, oh, it's got a, an 80 or 90 whatever on Rotten Tomatoes. It's like, all right, it might have primarily fresh reviews, but if you look at the at the score average, it's something like six out of 10, where my review was a five out of 10. It's not like it's that wide of a gap. It's just my review fell to the Rotten Splat side versus a fresh one. So I tend to have that and I also just tend to get very precious about things I love and mo movies I love and scenes I love where I'll, I'll take it very personally. I just remember one time, I don't know if I've ever brought this up, but you ever see, I think I've said this once before, Europa Report. No, I haven't not. So I think it's a great movie. You should go watch it if you haven't. And I was in a phase where I loved it and I watched it a couple times and then I, you know, I went home to see my family and I made them watch it. And five minutes into the movie, someone said, this is stupid, let's turn it off. I, I got up and left the room and like sulked like a child. I just took it so personally and got so mad. Did not answer that question at all because I can't think of an example. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, 
I have to do, disagree with him about the Captain America Civil War scene. I <laughs> love that airport mm-hmm. sequence. Yeah, this one's a little tough because yeah, picking out scenes that that because most of the time when people talk about sequences or scenes, usually they live up to to the expectation because uh, like you know, like the chariot race scene in mm-hmm. Ben Hur, the classic one. I'm not talking about the the most recent one. Stuff like that. It's not um, that bad in the most no, recent no, one. No, no, it's not. Yeah. It's not. Um, but for me, I would have to say this isn't an action sequence, but it's a movie that I. I liked, but I didn't find to be as worthy of the praise that it got, which was American Beauty. Hmm. Uh, you know, it won the Oscar for Best Picture. This basically the scene with with the plastic bag didn't do anything for me. You know, like I think for other people, they thought it was you know beautiful, or they they thought it was you know fit well into the film. I thought it was maybe a little pretentious. I thought people you know are bringing a lot of their own ideas and thoughts into the interpretation of what what that scene and sequence meant so that that's one for me i can Um, understand that shanae do you have any scenes in particular that you're that you did not care for that everyone else seems to love um i don't know if i have ones that other people seem to love but i guess i could answer this question when he's like movies that you can't watch because of scenes Mm -hmm. um the amazing spider-man 2 Mm -hmm. where her head hits the ground ruins oh. the entire movie for me. I mean, the movie already sucks, let's be real. <laughs> but if it didn't suck enough, and I've said this before on the show, if it didn't suck enough, that was like the icing on top of a terrible, disgusting, soggy <laughs> cake. But when her her head hit the ground and it made that sound, it infuriated me so much because I just felt like it was unnecessary at that point and it was just like ridiculous. And I was like, why? Or why is, what has happened in this entire movie? And then that's, what you leave me with at the end, this is disgusting. Um, but I will say that I, it takes a lot for me to find one scene so awful that I won't watch mm. the rest of the movie. The ones that stand out to me, I would say, are when extras are really noticeable. Like, What was the trailer where that happened? Dunkirk. 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 That's like, the greatest. And to this day, like, I know when I see that movie, I'm going to be looking for that. Those are the things that stick with me. I can get over, like, annoying scenes or annoying characters and scenes and being like, well, I hate, or really scary scenes sometimes. I'm like, what's the point of me watching this movie if, like, the scene that everyone talks about, like, I can't even watch it because I'm so scared. Um, but extras being doing the wrong thing and being really obvious about it are things that I can't get over at all. <laughs> but I love it because it's hilarious. Yeah. That That's an interesting one. Mm-hmm. All right, uh, what's next? Paul writes, hey, Collider Gang. I'm a huge fan of the show and glad to see John is back hosting again. I hope this gets on the air because I wanted to know your take on this. I continually hear from friends, people on social media that Guardians of the Galaxy is their absolute favorite Marvel movie. I've always been a little confused by this. While Guardians is a good and fun movie and has some great scenes in my opinion, I wouldn't say it's the best Marvel movie. I would say that would go to Captain America Winter Soldier at least for now, is because it has so much more humor than the other Marvel movies. I honestly felt it was choppy, and some scenes like the scene where Quill rescues Gamora in space was really far-fetched, while Winter Soldier, even though it is, even though it, it still is a comic book movie, felt more grounded on reality. Why do you think Guardians is so revered as the best? Thanks for taking my question, and may the Schwartz be with you. Um, I'm, I'm not one of the people who has Guardians as their favorite MCU film, though I, I do really enjoy it. And I have found it's not a general consensus that, that all, everyone loves Guardians of the Galaxy as their number one movie, or at least number one Marvel film. But I have run across uh, several people, several people that I respect that it is. And I, I can understand why. It just There's a chemistry to, to the team. There's a sense of adventure and fun. It's, it's something different for them. Marvel Cinematic Universe. So I, when when someone tells me that, I, I don't look at them funny or anything like that. I think okay, they enjoy this film, which which uh, d- speaks to their sensibilities. What about you, Perry? We need to differentiate the terms best and favorite. Yes. A lot of people, like myself, walk around and say my favorite MCU movie is Guardians. Filmmaking wise, do I yeah. think it's better than Winter Soldier and some others? 
maybe not in certain certain areas, but I actually do. I do really genuinely think Guardians is one of the most well made movies with such a firm handle on the style and tone of that movie. Because if it wasn't like that, that movie wouldn't have worked on any level. It is such an extreme departure from all the previous MC mo- MCU movies we've gotten. James Gunn, I think, did an incredible job. It, it's my favorite, and it's my favorite. Not necessarily because of the the reasons I just mentioned, even m- just more so because I love those characters so much. It's like I felt I remember the exact conversation I had when I walked out of the press screening with a group of my friends, and all of us were like, "Who's your favorite character?" And it was just this. Uh, like, I was so stressed about picking a favorite character because I genuinely connected with all the main guardians, and I really did like them so much. I thought Drax was hilarious. You know, I'm a sucker for cute creatures so obviously I fell in love with Groot I thought uh Bradley Cooper in the rocket role is just absolutely fantastic Chris Pratt couldn't have been more well cast in that role and I I want to see more Gamora I might have walked out of that movie thinking she was a little underserved and I really was enjoying the relationship between her and Nebula and I'm looking forward to exploring that further in the next movie but yeah I mean Guardians is my favorite movie and I I think it is one of the MCU's best uh, Sinead, what about you? Why do you think, uh, it, where does Guardians rank for you in the Marvel Cinematic Universe? And, and have you found that a lot of other people consider it their favorite one? I think that the reason why people love Guardians so much is because it is a little bit different than the rest of them. And it's, to me, I do find it pretty far-fetched, but it makes sense for their universe. Like, I, I'm like, all right, this totally makes sense. Like, Sure, it's far fetched, but I mean they're in space half the time. It like it, what what did we expect from it? Um, ranking wise, I would say Guardians is really close to the top. Uh, I think Cap- the first Captain America will always be my favorite. Like I just can't ever shake it. And then um, probably Guardians would probably be second, mm. and then Civil War, um, or maybe those two are flipped. I don't know. But for me, I find it way better than like the. Thor, like the dark world. So when that like sticks out to him, that surprises me a little bit because I feel like if I look at the whole MCU, I could find other movies that I don't like as much. But I mean, like it's so different and it's so far fetched where I could understand why he could find issue with it. But I think the reason why people love it so much is because of that reason, because it's not what you don't get that in any other MCU movie. It was new characters at the time, right? We'd never seen them in another movie and it's really freaking funny like it's really funny the soundtrack is so perfect Everything it gives it such like this it. infectious energy yeah. where you just you can't stop listening to it and it it just excites you it ups yeah. the adrenaline of the movie every time you cut from one track to the next or one scene to the next it's so good but thor the dark world is a good example of a movie that is not as well made as the others but still has entertainment value because right. i enjoy it but i will 110 percent admit that is definitely not the best mcu movie no, by far not. but just given the fact that we are now at the end of october and going into november all i can keep thinking about is you know year end top five top ten lists are coming and i just always i think every single year and i've been doing this for a while every single year i've posted a top ten list my opening paragraph of that list is always, just so you guys know, these are my favorite movies. Yeah. These aren't the best movies of the year. So it's like that that answer is already swirling in my head at this point. Yeah, the, there is a different distinction between best and favorite. Mm-hmm. There's movies that, that you just have some, some, for you some have reason. You have a thing for it. Yeah. yeah. Even well, though you know it's not the best movie. Totally. And Paul also, I, this just, I just remembered, my sister also found Guardians super cheesy. Like she did not get what I saw in the movie. And she was like, it was so cheesy. Like, it was so cheesy. So I have heard that opinion before, and it kind of makes sense. I just like cheese, I guess. <laughs> I think you just have to, if you can buy into a movie <laughs> and it can sell you on in the world, you can get taken for that ride. But if you, from the beginning, are like, oh, no, I don't, uh, what's this stupid uh, plant talking or a raccoon talking? Ah, this is stupid. Right. You're, you're just not going to get into it. Totally. It's just crazy because the opening title sequence is so good. Yeah. When he's walking in into that building yeah. and you have the perfect song playing in the background and he kicks that little lizard. Oh, I love it. <laughs> All right. Uh, what's next? AJ writes, hey, guys, my name is AJ Robinson. Really love your work. Started following you since Force Awakens. Spoiler review. So my question is, what are your hopes for the future of cinema in upcoming years? What changes would you like to see in movies these days? Thanks and keep up the great work. Well, I don't know if you're talking about technological changes or I don't know. But for me personally, I I like it. So I'm thinking about more of the movie going experience. I I definitely want to go more towards 
you know, the premium thing where it's like larger screens, great sound, you know, comfortable seating. But then on the other hand, also variety of movies. Cause you know, a lot of times you go to a theater and it's like, it's it's a very even though it's like let's say has 16 screens on it eight of them could be one blockbuster and then then two and then you end up not actually having that big of choice uh or that many choices to to see certain movies so i i'd like to see more variety you know we have all these seasons of movies where it's like okay this is the season where it's summer blockbuster tentpole movies oh and now it's oscar season oh this is the dumping ground season i would just like to have instead of that having i don't think it's going to happen but more variety where it's okay you're getting a mixture of all those films at the same you know con- consistently throughout the year mm-hmm. instead of having those different different time periods what about you perry for talking about the movie going experience i agree with you i like the premium feel i am i will pay extra money to be comfortable and see movies using a better projector and better sound system that brooklyn horror film festival where my movie just premiered i walked in because you know it's a uh that festival is a brand new festival so i assumed it'd be in you know like a small like starter theater it's a place called, I think it's called The Syndicate in Brooklyn, and I walked in. This is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. First, it's like, I, I wish I could show everybody out their scale, but the first room is like the size of our studio, and it's a bar, and a really nice bar with tables, and it's got a light food menu, and a really nice bar, and then in the back is a really beautiful, I want to say like 50 to 60 seat theater. And it's kind of like the Alamo draft house Mm -hmm. vibe where you have tables in between and you could put the little cards up during the movie and they'll deliver food to you as the movie's playing. But it's like Alamo draft house, but the premium version Mm -hmm. where the seats are really nice and leather. And just, I love that experience. So I want more of that. But when I was writing my own answer, I was thinking more of just storytelling Mm -hmm. and, I just want there to be more original mm-hmm. quality films out there. That's that's all I can ask for. I just want to see studios with all these resources taking more risks and, and making more unique things. And, you know, one company that really excites me right now is Blumhouse because they have that BH tilt arm, which is more geared towards, I'm not sure if it's limited theatrical releases, if that's included, but they're more geared towards VOD. And that gives them the opportunity to take more risks and, you know, hedge their bets on up and coming filmmakers and really strange stories that might not appeal to the the wide audience out there. So I am looking forward to seeing maybe studios explore that kind of distribution arm further. I know Paramount had a thing with um, Scout's Guide and Paranormal Activity where they released those movies in theaters and just a couple weeks later, so like a really short window, they released it on VOD. I'm just really excited to see where all of these different distribution methods could go and how that could further enhance the chance of getting more original out there content. Very cool. Shanique? Um, Well, for me, I have a couple things. So like genre-wise and storytelling-wise, I just love the resurgence of like straight action movies. Mm -hmm. What you see is what you get. John Wick, The Accountant, which I really loved, where it's just kind of like you go in, you don't need a sequel. Mm -hmm. Great if they give you one. You don't need it. You kind of get the whole story. Straight action, no crazy weird sci-fi and Mm -hmm. effects. And while I love all those things, it's kind of nice just to see someone kick ass with with their hands and with some guns. Like that's cool with me and I love that we're seeing that more pop up. And I hope that this is the start of just like those awesome action straight action movies and these action stars kind of like rebranding um that excites me a lot and then like on a marketing perspective like i feel like we live in a time right now where fans really feel super connected to their favorite actors and directors because of things like twitter and instagram Mm -hmm. and like people retweet and comment and things like that and i think it was john boyega that started popping up in theaters of the Star Wars Force Awakens and he would pop up and be like surprise I'm here and people lost their minds that to me is so cool and I feel like now is the right time for them to like kind of integrate some way of of connecting movie stars and directors with people as their movies are being released because we already feel like we're so much closer to them than ever before Mm -hmm. because of social media. That is something that kind of faded away. I feel like for a while people were exploring new ways to market a movie. Like to make you feel connected with the filmmakers and also make engross you in the world prior to a movie coming out. I just remember... Oh, what was it called? Uh, Repo Man with uh, 
was it Ewan McGregor? I don't know, but whatever that movie was, they had a website that was like the company website and it made you feel like you were going to the company to get yeah. an organ. And, yeah. and actually uh, uh, today on, uh, yesterday on Movie Talk, we were talking about uh, a cure for wellness. Mm -hmm. And if you get to the end of the video of that trailer, I think there's, a, there's links, automatic links to it. And so that, that company, that place that Dane DeHaan goes to, it's like some sort of like meditation retreat facility. Mm -hmm. And there's videos online that are made by the A Cure for Wellness promotional machine where you watch it and it's supposed to give you a meditation like, type that's effect. That's very cool. Yeah. I, I like stuff like that. And yeah. I, I wish more companies were doing that. I remember in, in school, they were there was a class about, you know, just the rise of new media and new ways to promote a movie where it's like the J.J. Abrams mystery box thing, how we had the whole thing with Super 8 where it's kind of piecing together the clues and you feel part of it I just mm -hmm. want more of that yeah or like nowadays like with conventions since everyone's on this convention craze and like new ones are popping up all the time um, you can make a specific convention or like rent out a theater even for a night mm -hmm. and like we were talking about that Evil Dead thing right mm -hmm. where they're Bruce Campbell's like hosting it and it's Evil Dead in concert and it's just like gets people who love Ash vs. Evil Dead like super in the spirit and it's around Halloween like I feel like there's so many smart ways because as press we get inv invitations to those things but for fans just fans who love one movie and they're like I would love to hear I would love to see this movie and then go hear the director and the cast talk about it for one night pay like 50 bucks like just things like that I feel like would be really cool right now. Yeah. And Perry, you mentioned something about VOD. I, I think that's also probably in the future of cinema where, yes, you will go to these more premium experiences, but will, those will be for the big, big movies where some of these smaller films, I think a lot of times is they're going to be sent straight to video right. on demand. And I actually don't see a huge problem with that, especially if you you know, have a decent setup at home and, and maybe these smaller films can can get a, a wider audience and if they are successful studios will take more chances on these smaller films it, as long as there's a distribution method for yeah. them all right what's next tracy writes hail collider crew greetings and groovified salutations from trinidad and tobago very cool it's only just dawning on me so i asked do tv shows have reshoots i know the pilots might like star trek original series but episodic wise do they much thanks keep up the great work p.s that general hospital doctor strange bit cracks me up 10 points disney uh pilots definitely do reshoots because they they want to make sure that the tone and the way direction of the series is is where they want it to go. A, a good example of that is the Game of Thrones pilot was actually they actually did a lot of reshoots mm -hmm. on that. They actually recast some of the actors and actresses. And so from what I heard, like almost fifty percent of that pilot it was all reshoots. Right. Um so in the case of something like that, yeah, but I think generally in the schedule, the way that TV is shot, they don't have time to do reshoots because remember, like let's say a movie, you get three or four months to maybe six, five, six months of sh to shoot a film. To That's like a two hour thing. Where in a TV series, you're doing anywhere between, let's say 13 episodes of television to 22 episodes of television. That's a lot to shoot in a very short amount of time. So they don't have time to be like, oh, well, th you know, that that one, that that take of you, it wasn't quite right. Let's go back. They, they, they just don't have that time. Yeah. What do you think, Perry? I, I think you're you're exactly right. And, you know, Westworld was another one that came to mind. I know they shot that in like 2014 and they had to redo some stuff. I imagine most shows will have a little wiggle room just in case there's any major problems. But, you know, when you're talking about, I don't know what's coming to mind now, something that has like 22 episodes, airs, week, CW. To week, airs week to week, and they're shooting it week to week too then you kind of have no choice but there's a lot of things like I know Ash, Ash versus Evil Dead for example shot all of their episodes and then they aired so maybe they're the ones that are in the position to reshoot something if necessary but I just remember a couple years ago I went on a dual TV set visit for The Night Shift which is actually a lot of fun if you haven't watched it and another show called uh, called Killer Women <laughs> Have you ever heard of that? No. I think, was that the one that was kind of more like an anthology series? No, it was, no? Okay. It was not an anthology, okay. but that that show came and went. We went, we, it was the worst was it thing on ever. Was Lifetime? It was awful. I don't even remember what it was on. It's, uh, oh, I wish I could remember the actress's name now, who was the lead of it, but it was, one, it was awful, and it went off the air within like, 
five episodes, oh, if not shame. if not less. And it was just such a bummer because when you do set visits, it's a lot of fun when you go, but it's a lot of work to actually write everything up and then put it online. And then the show just vanished and my set visit didn't matter. But that was an example where they shot the pilot in a specific location. And when it went to series, they they decided that it'd be best to shoot it in another location. And they were just in a situation where they couldn't fake it. They had to change the location, I believe, to, uh, I forget where it was now, but you know, sometimes that happens. And, uh, the new MacGyver, they are completely re- they completely reshot the pilot and someone else directed it once and then James Wan stepped in and is directing the, the pilot episode that we're gonna see. Well, he was originally supposed to. Did that ever premiere? MacGyver? Yeah. It did. Huh. It's fine. Okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, he was supposed to. Um, I will say that like I, when I did Nickelodeon, I remember like you have a, a set wrap time and they say like, oh, you guys are gonna be done filming by six o'clock. And you're yeah. always there like till yeah. midnight, one, two o'clock, I think is when we finally wrapped on that Friday. We were there till like 1.30 alone on the lot. Um, and because they will shoot it until they get it right. Because in their heads, there are no reshots for yeah. a lot of those shows that are just running. Um, and if you think about soap operas, like those shoot every single day. Once they wrap an episode, it's like a distant memory. I don't think they even have the idea of reshooting because it's not in the budget. Yeah, no budget, no time. I mean, if you think about like something like CW shooting like The Flash, it's 21, 22 episodes. You're shooting stuff and then it's going to the edit room. You're not the editors are not going to find out if there's an issue or a problem until way later. And right. by that time, you know, the, there's no time to go back and 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 fix it. So I, I, it's it's just the schedule, mm-hmm. the schedule, the budget, and the time. In case anyone's curious, Killer Women starred Trisha Helfer from uh, Battlestar. Oh, That's okay. what it was, and she was the she was playing the first uh, female well, Texas Ranger. That's hilarious. ABC. What? Yeah. Oh, maybe that's why we never heard about it. Yeah, came yeah. and went. It wasn't a, it wasn't no. a good show. Yeah, shame. Uh, all right, what's next? Hey, Brights. Hey, Collider Crew. Ever since I stumbled on your YouTube channel since January of 2016, you have been a daily fixture in my life. I know some people are picky when it comes to movies. For example, some won't watch a musical because it's all singing, or a horror movie because it's too scary, a.k.a. me. But me, being African American, I refuse to watch movies or documentaries that deal with slavery or civil rights. Now, don't get me wrong. I've seen Glory and other movies of this genre, but I haven't seen Selma, Red Tails, 12 Years a Slave. I've heard good things about Birth of a Nation, but I'm reluctant to go see because I will get angry. I know it is history and the director is just portraying art on screen so it can be viewed. My question is, have you guys ever refused to watch a movie due to circumstances or just not your cup of tea? Uh, For me, I'll watch almost anything. The one thing I won't watch is anything that's kind of torture porn related where it's a horror film where it's, you can tell everything is about just the gore and and like i prefer we we just talked about a movie talk uh yesterday that cure uh, cure for wellness like that's a horror film but you can tell it's like has a more psychological bend to it it's creepy it's it's like and uh, there'll probably be maybe something maybe a little more gory in it but i'm sure that if there is it services the story i just don't want to see a film where that's the only thing Like, like a movie like was it Human Centipede? Like, yeah. I just have no, like, no, I'm not seeing that movie. I'm not seeing that movie. I'm not seeing the sequel. I don't care. <laughs> it is like, I don't need stuff to gross me out. That what was about, my example, actually. Really? Human Centipede 3. Oh, God, I will say, three all of right. them? Human <laughs> Centipede is the sickest idea ever. It is so freaking disturbing that someone oh. out there came up with that idea. I will say the first movie, even beyond the shock factor of what the concept is, it's actually a pretty good horror movie. Nah. I I don't know. It's really gross and hard to watch, but I give Tom Six credit for that movie. Then, however, that hype went to his head, and Human Centipede 2 is, oh my God, it's atrocious. It is one of the worst movies I've ever seen in my life. It is so incredibly upsetting and, oh my and unnecessarily upsetting. And that was one thing where I think that was one of the only movies where I was ever asked to cover something. And I said no, because I didn't want to see three. But there's a scene in Human... I can't believe I'm thinking about this now. A Human Sent to Be Two where like some woman gives birth to a baby while she's trying to escape in a car and like steps on... Sorry, spoilers. If you're ever going to watch it, you shouldn't. But she steps <laughs> on the gas and like crushes her, her infant baby. And it's just like why like why would you do that there's nothing scary it looks like cheesy and it it's Does really the baby die 
It's just really, oh uh, it's God. things like that that are just sick. so unnecessarily upsetting. Don't ever, ever watch. I'm like upset now that I just explained that because thinking I'm about it is, is really oh. freaking disturbing. But there, yeah, there's lines that can be crossed within that genre. And I think, uh, I think Human Centipede is the perfect example of that. And then uh, animal abuse things. I mean, yeah, I've said it before. Sick. I know people are very aware of that some things upset me with that so if i know that a movie is coming out where something happens of that nature and it's excessively graphic or it's the the subject of the movie i might try to avoid it however you know when i'm asked to cover something it's very unlikely i'll say no what about you Sinead? so for me the only movies that i refuse to watch are uh horror movies that have everything to do with um like satanic and demons mm. and things like that that stuff freaks me out i would much rather watch someone being slashed a gajillion times and blood everywhere than watch someone being possessed and that jump scare stuff i don't mind jump scares in slasher movies but there's something about demons and poltergeists and things like that that i cannot handle but for him i don't think that you have like bad taste in movies or anything i just think it's something that's super upsetting to you the same way it's upsetting to us like it doesn't matter what the context really is like you have some something that you connect to in a different way then you're not going to watch it yeah all right uh Aww, that's such a bummer yeah let's move on to the last <laughs> question i cannot get that image out of my head uh, oh yeah i'm like yeah, I'm, I'm really mad at myself now that I'm thinking about it even. And I immediately thought of Harrison. He killed me right then. Oh, my God. I guess I can understand that, because if someone had told that same story with a kitten, that's where my head would have gone. Right. Well, mm. you know. Oh, my God. I wish we could wipe the slate clean <laughs> and never think about that ever again. Eat a donut. That's right. All right. Well, maybe Marcus will help us feel better. He writes, hello, Movie Talk crew. Been a three-year subscriber and love every minute of this show. Lately, I've been thinking about moving to L.A., but I'm still trying to figure out if it's the best thing to do. I'm an aspiring filmmaker who lives in Atlanta, and true enough, Atlanta has been booming in the film industry from Marvel movies to Fast and Furious and so on. But I'm still trying to figure out what, what, or I'm still trying to figure out would moving to LA be the best thing or should I stay in Atlanta if I'm trying to make a name for myself in the film industry thanks guys and keep up the great work that you do uh, I don't think it's absolutely necessary for someone to move to LA to become a filmmaker I think you especially in a place like Atlanta where you do have there is a community over there and you can work on your own projects and, and you know hone your craft I'd say the only moving to LA would have its benefits, but also its drawbacks. I mean, definitely because it's Los Angeles, you, the, the resources and, and kind of the depth of talent that you're going to get is going to be higher. I mean, in terms of in front of the camera and behind the camera, you're just going to have a better pool of actors around you that, that, that you have access to. You also have better crew members that are more experienced. So you have all that, but then at the same time, you're kind of a, you know, a small fish in a big pond where, now you're fighting, um, not fighting, but th there's more competition. There's more, you know, a lot of other things that in order to get noticed, it takes a little bit more. So I don't know, I, I wouldn't say it's absolutely necessary for you to move. I think, you know, staying in Atlanta and doing your thing and trying to build up, you know, both your experience and reputation is the way to go. What about you, Perry? Well, I just made the move from New yeah. York to here. And I think it's just a matter of you personally, depending on what your what your specific, specific goals are within this industry. For me personally, I've been living my entire life saying I will never move out of New York. I love it to death. I'm happiest here and can't be happy anywhere else, which clearly wasn't the case because it was kind of like when the decision came up, it was almost like ripping a Band-Aid off. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I just had to commit and make the jump and do it. And I can tell you right now, given the end of the industry we're in, it's night and day between here and New York. I think I've, I've just accomplished more in the past month and I've enjoyed myself more in the past months. And not to say that I didn't like what I was doing before, but I've kind of reached a new level of happiness in my career out here. So I think that's one end of it. And as a filmmaker, when I graduated film school, that was a big conversation within my whole class. It was, who's gonna move to LA? Who's gonna stay in New York? And I can't really speak to moving to LA as a filmmaker, but my mentality at the time, which I think is still a fair thing to be thinking, is in New York, 
it was a much more, I, yes, you have a bigger community out here in LA, but it was a much, it felt like a more close knit community there where mm. everybody knew everybody. And you, you had almost more access to more unique things, mm. you know, like more unique settings. And, and it just felt, it felt easier to make things happen within the community. Whereas me envisioning myself coming here as a producer, it's just, there's so many different ways I can go. There's so many different people I could, I could go, I could go to to make things happen. Perhaps if I had come out here as a producer, I would have formed my own filmmaking family. But as someone being in New York, where the focus is primarily on independent filmmaking and making original stories your way, that was much more my speed. Whereas I was afraid as a recent graduate of a film school that I would come out here and, you know, I would wind up only being able to be like an executive assistant or getting sucked up in the studio system and not being able to make what I wanted to make. Yeah. And then you make a good point about location. So L.A., since it is L.A., every place knows and it has rented out their places so it's like really expensive to get like unique locations yeah. where the smaller the town you're in, the easier it is to get locations because they're more willing to like, oh, cool. Like uh, my my place or wherever my restaurant gets to be in a in an independent film. Cool. And maybe it'll be a, a much smaller fee or, or maybe no fee at all in, in exchange for promotion. But as soon as you come to L.A., they are all hmm. very internet sat or not internet uh entertainment savvy so there'll be like oh well uh we need this amount of money and blah 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 and all, all these all these things that's an issue in manhattan too because manhattan has some serious rules if you want to shoot something in manhattan you can't put any equipment on the ground unless you get a permit and permits cost money whereas where we shot our film we went up to catskill and there it was like oh a movie use my location i mean they weren't they didn't say you know it was a horror movie. They didn't say like drop your fake blood all over our yeah. location and ruin it or anything, but they were definitely much more excited about it and they wanted to be part of it too. It's like in some scenes in the movie, you can see it was shot in a, in a game farm, like an old game farm. You could see the, the people who own it as extras in the movie. So uh, it's just like a fun, nice little touch when people that are in that location are ex as excited about it as you are. Yeah. Sinead, uh, what would your advice be to this? I would just say like, depending on what kind of films you want to make too, you got to go where the opportunities are. So Atlanta is up and coming and even in TV as well. I don't, I don't know much about many other cities. I lived in Atlanta for a hot minute. I'm from Chicago and now I live in LA. So those are the three cities that I know the most about. And out of those three cities, I do think that LA has more opportunity in terms of making films because there's a lot more smaller independent films being made. I mean, I don't know what New York is like, but I believe it, that there's a lot of independent movies out there. Um, and you gotta go where people are super excited to make films too. So you're gonna pick cities where, where you can kind of collaborate and find people who are also getting started and people that wanna produce and people that wanna write and people that wanna act that are all getting started in the business too. It's much harder to get, start, a, start a career and have like nobody around you to collaborate with. You're eventually gonna have to go out and seek those people. But I would say like, you're gonna start, if you're starting, you're gonna start with indie projects, maybe like short films, seven, eight minute films, which is what I did a lot when I first moved to LA. I used to do the NYFA films and LA, LA Institute films um, when I was acting. And it was just people who had just graduated school even and had kind of kept in contact with their classmates and were like, let's keep doing this, let's keep doing this. They ended up being great, mm -hmm. they were awesome, but you just gotta go where where there's opportunity and where you feel like movies are being made that you'd want to be a part of. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I know I've heard great things about Atlanta and they say that that's the next big city, so that's a tough one. At least that's your home. You could always go back there. But in my opinion, also, I kind of feel like everyone should come out here for a minute because you never know what kind of opportunity you can find out in L.A. as well. And I think for people not being from L.A., you can kind of see that once you move here, there is a lot to do in the business. Mm -hmm. There absolutely is. It also feels necessary to warn people. Like in my situation, for example, I'm, I'm running around saying, oh, I'm so happy I moved to L.A. I moved to LA to come to this office. Like I had a team of people that I was going to be yeah. with when I got here. So I most certainly was not alone. I have a lot of people who, you know, bit the bullet and took the plunge.
Dungeon came out here with nothing, mm -hmm. with no plan, no family, no friends out here. And while a lot of them are thriving now, I know that the beginning was very, very tough for them. So fair warning there as well. Yeah, Perry, you got welcomed into this family right off the not bat. A, not a day goes by <laughs> where I don't realize how freaking lucky I Aww. am. And well, we're know. happy to have you. Aww. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Just joking. <laughs> All right, guys, that's it for this episode of a Mailbag. Uh, Sinead, where can people find you? I'm online at Sinead DeFries and at that's so Sinead.com. I'm about to destroy a box of Entenmann's mm. donut holes. Um, I'm also here on Mondays hosting TV Talk and on Fridays hosting Movie Talk and on Mailbag over the weekends. Perry? You can catch me on Twitter and Instagram at PNamoroff on Collider Nightmares every Tuesday, best of the week every Saturday. And if you're not watching it already, please check out After Ash, our official Ash vs. Evil Dead after show every Sunday night after the episode airs on Stars. And thanks to Cody and Adam in the back over there. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at ThinkHero or Instagram Dennis.TZNG. You can also find me on Movie Talk on Fridays, Mailbags on Saturdays, and some of our spoiler reviews, commentary videos, trailer reviews, and reactions. Don't forget to subscribe to this YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Collider Videos, and we'll see you guys next time. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.